I'm not one to ever pass up an opportunity for a good deal on some high-grade cannabis. So when I received a text from a friend of mine telling me that he could sell me a quarter ounce of some good shit for $25, I jumped at the chance. He led me on all day, telling me he would be dropping it off in the evening. Evening came, and so did the text saying he'd drop by later that night. And finally, at 11.30 that night, I received a text that sent a ping of anxiety running through me. Sup, man. I'm headed out of town for the night. Your sack is in the garage under the ladder. I knew exactly what this entailed. I was to walk the five blocks to his old residence, a mutual friend's house where he lived in a loft in the garage, slip in unnoticed by the neighbors, search until I found it, leave the money, and be on my merry way. Simple, right? Wrong. The walk started off sketchy enough with the lone street light on the block going out as I left, plunging me into this unnatural pseudo-darkness. I walked along in silence, the only sound coming from the highway some distance away. I'd walked this walk before, even at this hour, but I couldn't shake this anticipation in my gut. I reached the house, which I must say is absolutely terrifying at night. Something didn't seem right. My friend is very strict with his bedtimes. This meant that the house was dark at exactly 10 p.m. each night. Tonight, though, there was a glow coming from the first floor. This could have been a number of things. Maybe he had other friends over, brought a girl home, getting a late night snack. I quickly reassured myself as I stepped through the door into the pitch black garage. I closed the door behind me and got to searching. The garage is separated into an upstairs and downstairs to save space. Upstairs, there's a washer and dryer, while downstairs was box storage that led under the stairs, forming a cave-like layer. Not gonna lie, it felt like a robbery simulator, rummaging through my friend's garage unnoticed, looking for drugs. My heart began to race at the thought. It really started racing, though when I heard the heavy footfalls stomping their way toward the inside garage entrance. I had kicked a paint can on accident, so they probably heard it. Now, my first instinct told me that I should make myself known. It was my friend's place after all. He probably even knew about the whole deal. We'd laugh, he'd point out where it was, and I'd be on my merry way. And that's when I realized something. My friend does not own a single pair of boots. In a split instant, I had ducked down under the floorboards behind some boxes. The door outside was quite far away, the footsteps quickly approaching, so escape was not an option. I had to hide it out. I was so confused, I felt like I was in a slasher movie hand over my mouth to keep from hyperventilating and everything. I listened as the door slammed open, the footsteps creaking slowly along the floorboards just inches to my right. They paced around the garage for what seemed like ages, grunting and taking heavy labored breaths. They stopped at the top of the stairs, never making their way down though. Soon enough, they made their way back into the house, slamming the door behind them. As soon as the door clicked, I bolted, and I didn't stop running until I was back home, tucked away in bed, every single light in the house on for the rest of the night. I wasn't about to get the cops involved with the situation, lest they go searching and get my friend in trouble, so I simply sent him a text message and went to sleep. I awoke to two texts in the morning. The first was a message from my dealer friend, asking me if I was alright. The second was a text from the friend who owned the house, telling me he got stuck at a friend's house overnight. I was so fucking confused. Later that day the friend with the house sent me news links over Facebook with no caption. 
It was a news report about a burglary and murder that took place on my friend's street. Two houses had already been confirmed as being broken into in the middle of the night. The first was the home of an injured veteran. He was found in the bedroom, a 9mm slug lodged into his head, all the valuables in the house gone. The second house was my friend's. When I was about 12, my great-uncle John came from Ukraine to visit us in Canada. He had a lot of stories, but this was the one that stood out. In the late 1960s, John was travelling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at one point, and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform and a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else at the station and other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter, and getting colder and darker, and just about the time he started worrying about having a place to stay and some food to eat, an old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked if he was waiting for such and such a train, and when he said he was, she said it wouldn't be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night, and offered him a meal and a room at her place, which she said was about an hour's walk from the station. Lodging with locals was more or less the standard when travelling in this part of the USSR, and Great Uncle John wasn't looking forward to a hungry night on a cold platform, so he was glad to accept her offer. He took his suitcase, and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. It was more than an hour away, more like two, and by the time they arrived at the woman's small two-story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside, and the woman lit some oil lamps and warmed some borscht for them. It was the first time John was able to see the woman clearly and he was a bit startled to realize that the old woman was actually a man. Not wanting to pry, and too tired to care, John finished his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. She led him up the stairs to a tiny room with a window that contained a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her, they said goodnight, and she closed the door. Then she locked it leaving him in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, John called to her, but she didn't answer, and he heard nothing. Figuring he would deal with it in the morning, and that she had probably done it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed, deciding to make the best of it and get some sleep. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to pee and got out of bed, hoping to find a chamber pot or something he could pee in. He got onto his hands and knees, and began to feel under the bed in the darkness, thinking that's where the pot would be if there was one. Instead, he found a body. Great Uncle John went right to the window to see if he could exit the room that way. It was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in the room, he was probably a dead man, but if he broke the window and tried to get out that way, there was a good chance that the old woman, and who knows who else was there, would hear him and come into the room before he could get away. So he did the only thing he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress, and covered it with the blanket. Then he got under the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps coming slowly up the stairs, and then towards the room. The lock clicked, and the knob turned slowly. In the gloom, John saw someone move towards the bed. He heard several terrific and sickening thuds. The person had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar, which they had then dropped on the floor right in front of John. There was silence, 
Then the person went out of the room, and the door was shut again. The footsteps went down the stairs, and then once more, silence. John moved out from under the bed, took the crowbar, and was able to slowly pry the window open. He didn't say, but I imagine he was shitting bricks the entire time. When the window was up, he threw his suitcase out, then dove through himself, not caring what was below him, only worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury, and began to run into a field behind the house, towards some lights in the far distance. It turned out to be a highway, with some military and transport trucks on it, and John was able to get a ride to another village where he could catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what happened to the authorities, since at that time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance he would be the one who got into trouble. He just thanked God that he escaped, and decided that the next time he travelled to visit relatives, he'd take another way. This next story is actually the experience of a female friend. Here's her story as it was told to me. I've never had anything like this happen before. This morning, I woke up and sent a text to my best friend Anna, asking if she wanted to go shopping and have lunch since it was my first day off in about two weeks. Not waiting for a text back, I got into the shower and started doing the usual shower routine. After about 10 minutes or so, I faintly hear the phone ring. Probably Anna. It stops ringing after two or three rings. I finally get out of the shower and first thing I do is check my phone. There are no missed calls, but there's a text message. I thought it was odd because my phone was definitely ringing as though someone was calling. When someone texts my phone, it just makes a little ping noise, not a full ringing sound. I checked the message, from my mom by the way, and what it said made my blood run cold. This is exactly what the text message said. Hey sweetie, just wanted to make sure you were okay. Your boyfriend said you were in the shower and he'd let you know to call me back. Have to run into a meeting so I won't be able to answer. Call me back later and thanks for letting me know you had a boyfriend, lol. After reading the message from my mom, I threw on clothes and drove as fast as I could to another friend's house. I don't have a boyfriend and I live alone. Someone was in my house, answered my phone and spoke to my mother. I know everyone will tell me to call the cops and I already did. They searched my apartment and found nothing. No random man under the bed or in my closet. No signs of forced entry. All the windows were locked as always. Nothing. I don't know how this person got into my house, or why he thought it was a good idea to answer my phone, but I'm too scared to go home. I'm staying with my friend now. I don't know what to do. I was hitchhiking through South Australia, heading west. I was about 14 years old at the time, and I got picked up by a carload of 20-something-year-old blokes in an old HQ. They were super drunk. At one point, one of these guys tells me that we're going to a party and asks if I want to come. Well, I was on a walkabout, and that's all about finding yourself and new experiences and all that. So I was like, hell yeah. But then, the driver got all upset. No. No he says. In a loud voice, he shouts, Fuck you guys. Not again. And he screeched the car to a stop in the middle of fucking nowhere. Get out, he says to me. I'm like, what? And all these other guys are protesting. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, Get out. Now. He seemed pretty serious, 
so I did. Everyone else in the car was losing their collective shit, and I was left standing on the side of the road, 200 clicks from fucking anything. Now, I don't know what they were planning, but in retrospect, I'm fairly sure it wasn't anything good. I have always had a innate fear of the night. Not so much the dark, but the night itself. As a child, my imagination was overcome with stories of creatures that come alive at night and the safety offered by a house and light. I never had anything to base this fear on, until a night when I decided to go with a buddy of mine to a baseball game and got stuck at a light at 2am after dropping him off at home. Of course, that night, the game went into extra innings and so I didn't get a chance to drop my friend off back home until well after 1am. Everything was fine on the way home until I hit a light right before the street that led to my house. It was a T-junction and I was turning left. The light is one of those that you think is broken until it finally turns green right when you finally decide to just run it. So, of course, I pulled up right as the light turned red. I would have just run the light, seeing as no one was there and it was closing in on 2am on a school night. But earlier that week I had heard the phrase, character is what you do when no one is looking and for whatever reason that was the night I decided to prove to myself that I was a man of character. Big mistake. I pulled to a stop at the light, feeling good about myself, bordering on self-righteous when I happened to look out of my window to my left and noticed a lady sitting all alone on a bus bench. We made brief eye contact and I quickly looked away. It was too late. I could see movement out of my peripheral vision and knew she was coming my way. I looked out the window and noticed she was carrying a bag. I quickly checked that my doors were locked and that all my windows were up. I then moved my right foot above the accelerator just in case and braced myself for what was to come. I was hoping it would just be an awkward exchange and was praying for a quick light change before she reached me so I could just get out of there but I knew there was a slim chance of that. She walked right up to my window, put down her bag, and began to tap on my window. I nervously looked up at her and she mentioned for me to put my window down. I had automatic windows, so I just imagined pushing too hard on the window button and that thing just coming all the way down. So I took a deep breath and lightly flicked it with my finger. The window moved microscopically down, but she didn't seem to notice or care. She then leaned in and began to talk. She said, My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? I should stop and give you a brief physical description of the bag lady. She was small and skinny and kind of an indeterminate age. She was either in her mid-twenties and had lived a hard 20 plus years on the street, or she was 60-something years old who had lived a moderately hard life on the street. All that to say, just by looking at her, there was no way to verify her story. She looked beat up by life, not just by a boyfriend. But there was something about her delivery. It, it was robotic and seemed practiced like she was disconnected for the moment. That made my skin crawl. And after a brief, maybe about a second debate on whether I should do it, I told her that I had to get home and that I couldn't give her a ride. After my first refusal, she leaned in closer and said the same thing again. My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? This time, I felt more confident when I declined to give her a ride and told her I had a curfew and had to get home. She leaned in a third time and began her statement again. My boyfriend beat me up. At this point, the light changed and I slowly lifted my foot off the brake and started slowly rolling forward and began muttering an apology. She didn't move. She just looked at the light, looked down at me, leaned in closer, and said five words that have haunted me ever since. You made the right decision. Then she picked up her bag and walked back towards the bench. I peeled out of the intersection and cried and screamed all the way home. I have no idea what she planned to do or if there were more people waiting to jump in my car from the bushes had I moved to let her in, but that encounter has haunted me ever since and has confirmed in my mind that nothing good happens after dark.
Last summer I came home to visit my parents and siblings. I usually spend my summers working for my university's housing, so I was really eager to get away from all that and spend a relaxing few months at home. My parents' house is in a decent neighborhood. Never had there been an instance of burglary or home invasions. It was a pretty quiet suburbia. I would even venture to say boring on some accounts. Anyway, last summer, the air conditioning was broken at our house and my dad was going to have a repairman come by and check it out around 2 p.m. and he would leave work early to meet him. My mom and sisters were off to work and school, so I was at the house by myself. My room was upstairs. I took a nap and woke up to the sound of a door slamming at around 1.30. I didn't think anything of it because I thought it was my dad meeting the repairman a little early. I decided I'd go and join them to see what the damage was. I was eager to get the AC back because summers in Texas are awful. When I got to the second floor landing, I noticed something was off right away. It was dead silent. I heard my dad's gun cabinet open, the place where he kept his most prized guns. I thought it was strange, but my dad did love to chat and show off his things. I honestly had no clue what was going on. And then my cell phone rang in the bathroom next to my room. I was keeping it in there to charge because the outlet in my room was broken. It was my dad. He was calling to let me know that the repairman was coming at 3 instead of 2. Now, I've read where people talk about going cold all over when they're afraid, but at that exact moment, I felt like I was about to throw up everywhere. I was so scared, because whoever was downstairs was not my dad, and it apparently wasn't the repairman. I locked myself in the bathroom and told him what was going on. He promptly told me to call the police, and I did. The operator stayed on the line with me and said the officers that would arrive had a safe word they would tell me to assure it was actually them. I sat in the dark bathroom for what seemed like ages, my heart racing. Finally, there was a soft knock on the door. The man said it was the police and gave me the safe word, and I quickly ran out to meet them, almost hyperventilating. And in a flash, all of the police officers were training their guns on me. I held my hands up, freaking out, but they ushered me away from the door quickly. I didn't have time to ask questions because the officers turned on the bathroom light. Standing in the bathtub was a man, dressed all in black, clutching a knife. He was staring right at me. He was there the entire time. She commandeered the room in the basement of her dorm room as soon as she realized she would have to pull an all-nighter in order to prepare for tomorrow's final exam. Her roommate, Jenna, liked to get to bed early, so she packed up everything she thought she would need and went downstairs to study, and study, and study some more. It was two o'clock when she realized that she'd left one of her the textbooks upstairs on her bed. With a dramatic sigh, she rose and climbed the stairs slowly to her third floor dorm room. The lights were dim in the long hallway and the old boards creaked under her weary tread. She reached her room and turned the handle as softly as she could, pushing the door open just enough to slip inside so that the hall lights wouldn't wake her roommate. The room was filled with a strange metallic smell. She frowned a bit her arms breaking out into chills. There was a strange feeling of malice in the room, as if a malevolent gaze was fixed upon her. Eh, it was a mind trick. The all-nighter was catching up with her. She could hear Jenna breathing on the far side of the room, a heavy sound, almost as if she had been running. 
Jenna must have picked up a cold during the last tense week before finals. She crept along the wall until she reached her bed, groping among the, co among the covers for the stray history textbook. In the silence, she could hear a steady drip, drip, drip sound. She sighed silently. Facilities would have to come fix the sink in the bathroom again. Her fingers closed on the textbook. She picked it up softly and withdrew from the room as silently as she could. Relieved to be out of the room, she hurried back downstairs, collapsed into an overstuffed chair and studied until six o'clock. She finally decided that enough was enough. If she slipped upstairs now, she could get a couple hours sleep before her nine o'clock exam. The first of the sun's rays were beaming through the windows as she slowly slid the door open, hoping not to awaken Jenna. Her nose was met by an earthly, metallic smell a second before her eyes registered the scene in her dorm room. Jenna was spread eagled on top of her bed against the far wall, her throat cut from ear to ear, and her nightdress stained with blood. Two drops of blood fell from the saturated blanket with a drip, drip noise that sounded like a leaky faucet. Scream after scream poured from her mouth, but she couldn't stop herself any more than she could cease wringing her hands. All along the hallway, doors slammed and footsteps came running down the passage. Within moments, other students had gathered in her doorway and one of her friends gripped her arm with a shaking hand and pointed a trembling finger toward the wall. Her eyes widened in shock at what she saw. Then she fainted into her friend's arms. On the wall, above her bed, written in her roommate's blood, were the words, Aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? Following a trail through the snowy woods on a cold winter night, suddenly the strong scent of a woman's perfume. Just in one particular spot, I was past it before it really registered. That's odd, I thought. I stepped back. Yes, I could smell it. I took another step, and the smell was gone. When I stood in one particular spot, I could smell it, but one step either way, there was nothing, and the trail did not intersect with another. I stepped off the trail into the deep snow, and sure enough, no scent to the left or the right. The night was still, no wind, a chill went down my spine. By this time I was looking around to see if maybe someone was hurt off the trail or even if there was a body nearby. I called out. No response. I called again, listening carefully, and I stood there wondering what to do. And then I carried on with my hair standing up on my neck, looking back over my shoulder. You know what? I just realized I had never looked up into the trees. Number 9. About a couple of months ago, around October, I wanted to make a Halloween video with some friends. We wanted to film a short film about a psycho in the woods. We went to my local woods where we were looking for a good spot to film. We ended up going down a small ravine to film. Everything was normal until we noticed some weird objects above the part of the ravine, so we went to go check it out. We climbed uphill from the ravine, where we found a small shelter, something that a man built to sleep in. Around the small shelter, there were dolls hung around it, deformed and almost satanic-like. The dolls were really unpleasant and made us uncomfortable. However, 
it looked good for our film, so we started filming there until we kept hearing noises around us and our anxiety was getting too high, so we just booked it out of there. We still filmed at the bottom of the ravine, but now with more friends. They didn't believe what we found, so we took them to see the dolls. We didn't hear anything, but some of our friends got really anxious, so we left. But me personally, I don't believe in paranormal stuff. But I did leave with scratches on my back that I did not feel until we left the woods. I have footage of us finding the dolls in the woods and pictures of the scratches on my back. It was really unpleasant finding those scratches, though. I went back recently to see if the dolls were still there with a friend of mine, but they were gone. But the shelter was still there. I don't know if there was a psycho living in the woods, but who will ever know, honestly. Number 14. My whole life I'd had paranormal experiences, so over the years I've grown used to them. One particular paranormal experience is something that gives me nightmares to this day. When I was between the ages of 5 and 11, my family lived in a small apartment building. My sister and I shared one bedroom, while my brother had the other. Both my parents slept in the living room downstairs. I would go downstairs every night to get water or a snack if I was hungry, and I never got scared because my parents were just feet from the kitchen sleeping. I remember that night I woke up in the middle of the night as usual and went downstairs to the kitchen to get water. Our kitchen had an odd half wall, so even if you were feet from it, you could still see the whole kitchen. I remember I had passed my parents who were sleeping at the time and made it just feet from the kitchen where I had been able to see the sink and window just above it. I didn't even make it to the kitchen. In front of the sink where the window was shining in lights from outside, I saw a dark haired woman looking out the window. I remember standing there for what felt like hours, but it only lasted about 10 seconds. The woman just stood there not moving for a few more seconds. And before I could even think of what to do next, this woman started bending weirdly, like her bones were breaking but no sound was audible. I stared at her not knowing what to do at the time. Before I could react, the woman turned completely and looked towards me. Her face was completely blacked out. I ran past my parents and back up to my bedroom. Let's just say I got no sleep that night. Since then, my family has moved from that apartment complex. And to this day, 10 years later, I can still see that woman so clearly in my head, and I hope I never encounter her again. Number 4. On November 4th, 2017, my grandmother had passed away. It wasn't until December when we moved into the old family house. My family and I, resting after a day of hard work, sat down in the living room with some old items of my grandmother's. Once we had all sat down, an old music box started to play slowly, with the little figures jerking instead of moving peacefully. We realized at once that this was the lost relative trying to get in contact with us, but as soon as one of us left the room it stopped and started when we came back. We soon realized the house was haunted with spirits of the many generations of our family that had built and lived here. 